Welcome to our town. Uh, our town is St. Petersburg. And in a larger sense, our town is this place that we give our energies to and have committed our hearts and minds to, to create something more interesting, better, more exciting, more productive for our fellows. And uh, this program, Our Town, came out of a conversation that Carol Mickett and I had uh, a year and a half ago, or maybe two years ago, and we spoke about, you know, we know the names of our baseball players in this town, but we don't know the names of the people who make uh, this community what it is. So we set about to uh, start a program. We didn't have a name for it, and Bob Stackhouse suggested Our Town. It was pretty clear. That was a great name for it. And uh, the program got started in that way, and it's had a rather illustrious history. If you like, you can look on the Internet and see most of the uh, productions, the ones where our sound was working, for instance, uh, online. Uh, tonight, we're really honored to uh, have Carol talk with Marvin Scaff. Uh, there are many leaders of the entrepreneurial community here tonight, so he really needs no introduction. But I would like to say for our, our regulars uh, that uh, Marvin has been uh, uh, a software engineer, an entrepreneur, and a venture capitalist um, in this community. Uh, on the edge of new developments. And perhaps what's most uh, significant uh, for our community is the way he has been a mentor for those trying to make a difference in these realms, interested in, in using their creativity and keeping it in our community. He's been a grand mentor for that. So we're honored tonight to have Carol talk with Marvin. Welcome. introduction and um, welcome I'm Carol Mickett and our town is a series about finding out what the identity of St. Pete is uh, but also looking at the broader issue of how does a place get an identity and in the 21st century um, things about technology have really stepped up I mean you can't uh, we were joking earlier. I told Marvin he had to turn his iPhone off, <laughs> give it away, and I was watching the audience, and everyone was like, "Me, me, 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 me." So, I mean, it's just become part of our lives. And there's always this buzz about entrepreneurship um, going on, and so it's a new way of shaping a community. Um, we think of it as being filled with young people, but of course not so young people are involved. So one of the things why I wanted Marvin here was to introduce, because we haven't had this element in our conversation about how technology influences a place, how entrepreneurs influence a place. So we have Marvin Scaff, who um, is part of St. Pete, the greater Tampa Bay area. And the first question I always ask my guest is, how did you come to St. Pete? I actually used to come here a lot when I was a little kid because my dad had five sisters and we used to come here for family vacations and always liked the area a lot. And then um, I was on vacation here in January and at the time I'm living in um, Columbus, Ohio and it was about 17 degrees and we came down with my family just to visit ants and I ripped a little ad out of the paper for a Macintosh programmer and I went back and um, I faxed them a resume and they FedExed me a plane ticket. I flew back down here, I went to lunch with the CEO of the company and he said about 30 minutes into lunch, like when can you start? And then I went back to Columbus, Ohio where I was living at the time and loaded up my truck and here I am. And <laughs> as I recall, that was 1992? Right. And you went to Largo? Actually, then I was living in Brandon, is in where Brandon. I first lived, and I was working for a software company called Technosis. And we were building a product for the Macintosh called Help. And it was basically a tool that users could be able to run on their computer and help them fix their own problems. So I came down to work on that. Which is connected with something that you did when you were young. So 
Um, you have a very interesting story. It's one of these tech stories about a young man. So um, could you tell us where you grew up and um, how you got to be into the Apple? Stuff? Sure. I was born in Ashland, Kentucky, which is near um, the town where I grew up, which is Flatwoods, Kentucky. And I was always one of those kids that was curious. And that's in the very northeast corner of Kentucky, near West Virginia. Right. It's near the Ohio, West Virginia, Kentucky border. Mm -hmm. So I was always fascinated by technology. And I used to get in trouble as a little kid for taking things apart just to see how they worked. And I was always fascinated by <clears throat> electronics and curious about, you know, why is the light on? Where's the sound coming from? And I got introduced to a company that started in town there that was selling high-end audio file equipment. And the owner of the company was one of the first Apple dealers in the country. And I just used to you know, be fascinated with you know, stereo equipment I couldn't afford yet and go there and just, you know, they would let me you know, just play around with the computers. But you're like 14 at this time? I was probably about 12. 12. And um, it's a pretty small town. I think today there's still maybe 10,000 people in the whole town. So it was unusual that a high-end... It, it really was. I mean, I consider mm -hmm. myself... I used to go to, um, like, the radio shacks and, like, the bookstores, and just, you know, I was always interested in just being a sponge and learning. But, you know, because this little company, it was called Sound Impulse, and the owner of the company took a liking to me, and I just was able to go there and hang out and... You know, they started selling Apple computers and, you know, they let me, you know, work there one summer doing car stereo installations and save up my money to buy an Apple II. So what year is this? This is... Um, uh, 80. 80. So what's, what's interesting about it is, I mean, he does this as a young kid, which may not seem so unusual now, but um, what did your parents do? Um, my mom raised our family. Um, I have a twin sister, and before we were born, she worked. And then my dad actually was a pipe fitter and worked in a steel mill. Mm -hmm. And what did your brother do? Um, my brother was an athlete. He was into basketball and boxing. Mm -hmm. So you were like the, the nerdy kid. I, I was. <laughs> but I also knew that, you know, I didn't want to go work in a steel mill and be a pipe fitter. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was always passionate about, you know, just learning as much as I could about technology because I saw that as like my meal ticket to get out of Flatwoods. <laughs> well, what's interesting is um, people like you and Mr. Jobs and people like that, when you read about their story, I mean, they come from families that you wouldn't think would, I mean, he was adopted and he had a different background, but you wouldn't think that they would end up doing the sort of thing you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, they're, you're sort of an anomaly in this. Sure. And what's interesting about it is how does that happen? How does it happen that somebody who um, comes from a background, and that absolutely doesn't mean that your parents weren't really intelligent, but they weren't in the groove to you know, move their kid along. So no, how were... did your parents be so open to this? Um. I mean, my dad was always very much um, like the tinker mm -hmm. <laughs> and very creative and doing things. You know, he worked in a steel mill, but I remember him getting like an award for coming up with an idea that like helped him save, you know, millions of dollars in the steel mill. But he was also really good about introducing me, you know, at the time, like ham radio was one area of electronics. So he had a, a buddy that he knew that was a ham operator. So I got invited to go over to his house when I was a little kid and he would let me look at his books and teach me about, you know, that aspect. I, mean, so I think you just you try to like identify potential mentors or sources mm -hmm. of knowledge, and then you know this is pre-internet, so today you have access to the web to learn quickly. But then I would have to wait, you know, monthly for magazines, or I would go hang out at the bookstores and wait for like Bike Bike Magazine or Dr. Dobbs Journal, and the frequency of being able to just get new information was, you know, the time period was like over a month or you know, mm -hmm. a longer period of time, and you know, I think that you just you have to have like the intellectual curiosity and just the passion about it and the drive to go out and want to do that. Now, you've talked about this um, audio store that had the first Apple. Mm -hmm. So why were you so interested in the computer and didn't just stay with the audio stuff? Um, once I figured out that computers are really about the software, 
like you have to have the hardware to have some place for the software to run, but you could write a little piece of code and like make a light flash on the screen. Or, you know, I remember writing like a program for Halloween on the Apple II and having like a little monitor in our window instead of a pumpkin outside. And it was just a little program that I just, you know, I wrote like just on my own to, because I thought it was cool, you know, just to learn. So how did you know that you could write code? Um, I didn't know that I couldn't, which I think is one of the big differences between children and adults. Because adults look at technology and they question, you know, why do I have to hit the return button? And if, you're, if you don't know any better, you just do it. And that's, I think, one of the reasons. But did you see it someplace? Were you in school? Or how um, did you even well, know what to do? At the time, when you bought an Apple II, they had the software came on cassette tapes. And then there were printouts of the program. So I would just you know, read through it, take the program, load up the tape in the computer, and then like, oh, what happens if I change this line you know, and run it again? What happens if I do this and change that? So it was just trial and error. And they let you do this at that company? Mm -hmm. yeah, I would go there. What a great it, guy. In the beginning, it was by like the local pizza place. So I would have to get my mom to drive me there. Hmm. And then you know, I would hang out. And then eventually, they actually relocated within walking distance of my house. So I would. You know, get off the school bus, go home and throw my books down and walk over to the to Sound Impulse and you know, listen to you know, high end audio equipment and you know, hack around in their Apple computers. So do you think that there was something special about the Macintosh? I mean, if it were a PC place, do you mm -hmm. think it would have been any different or the PC? Well this was in the early eighties mm -hmm. and the Macintosh didn't come out until eighty four. So at the time, the Apple II was the main personal computer that got commercial adoption. This mm -hmm. was before the IBM PC. Hmm. You know, I didn't know that. <laughs> well, the PC is, you know, the major thing that most people have. So, you know, the assumption is that's the one that started the market. Right. Hmm. <laughs> well, there you go. Um, so. Um, I'm thinking about the book I'm reading, so it makes sense given what I've read in the book. Um, so when you, so you're 12 and on you go, and you graduate from high school. So where do you go to college? Um, I thought I wanted to be an electrical engineer in computer science. Mm -hmm. And I went to um, University of Kentucky for a little while. And I got frustrated with like just higher education and the academic process, and I knew, I think, in some cases more than the people I was paying my parents hard earned money for mm -hmm. to get an education. And I was also doing consulting and making money and what going do you to mean school. You were doing consulting and making um, money. I was just getting you know, at this time there weren't very many people that were fluent in programming. So I got, you know, just programming jobs, writing software. I had, you know, a company that was the local auto auction. I wrote a program for the Apple II and there wasn't, you know, much competition because there wasn't anybody else around doing that. So I, was, I started doing that when I was... And how know, did they find you? Um, through the Apple dealer. They bought their computer there, and there wasn't some you know, off-the-shelf package they could just go buy for auto auctions, and they needed a database developed. And well, one thing we haven't mentioned is that when you were back in the audio store, you actually came up with a um, program, and you wrote to Apple about it. Yeah, I mean, I think... You know, necessity is always the mother of invention. Mm -hmm. And at this time, um, the way the manufacturing processes work, the integrated circuits or the chips weren't, um, it's called wave soldered to the motherboard. Mm -hmm. They were actually in little sockets. So, you know, because I was able to like pick the stuff up pretty quickly, I became like the tech support guy. And, you know, they would sell computers and then people would take them home and bring them back, you know, a few months later and there would be a problem that wouldn't work and you could go through and like jiggle the chips and like get it working again. And I just, I thought, well, why can't you take like a computer that's working and plug it into one that's not working and automate, you know, with the diagnostic tools, some of what, you know, I was just doing by just trial and error. Mm -hmm. And this was in um, like 81. Sort of like what you do with a car when you put it into a computer to find it, out what's wrong Very with similar, it. right. Mm -hmm. But I, um, I came up with this idea and I just, um, you know, the phone number for Apple was on all of their collateral and I just, you know, that one day after school, I just picked up the phone and I was like, called the, the receptionist in Cupertino and was like, hey, I got this idea. <laughs> and then they were like, really? <laughs> like routed around the people in the company and finally, you know, got somebody that was a guy in the service tools group who built 
diagnostic tool to support like the level two service centers and mm -hmm. they're like tell me about your idea what's your algorithm I'm like what's an algorithm <laughs> and then, uh, uh, like, uh, uh. you know start learning how to speak the language uh -huh. and then you know I put together you know this was in March and I put together um, you know the idea I sent it to them on like one sheet of paper and I get the like you know thanks but no thanks letter and then this just motivated me to build the prototype. You know, the mm -hmm. letter was basically, you know, Apple receives lots of ideas from our users, and yeah. you know, something like this could take man years to develop. And I just said, screw it. And I spent like the next four months and built the and actual you did prototype. It in four months. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you sent it to Apple. Yeah. Then I got back in touch with them, and then they're like, um, well, our, our policy is to accept ideas on this open policy, and it wouldn't, you know preclude you from getting patents and then about a month later I got a letter back from the guy who actually like spent time looking at it and it's like oh this is a really cool idea. <laughs> yeah. So did you get millions of dollars from it? No I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I got an attaboy. <laughs> a what? An attaboy. <laughs> <laughs> well it was a good experience. It, I mean it was but yeah. I, I think you know People talk about you know Tampa Bay not being like the epicenter of technology innovation, but neither was Flatwoods, Kentucky. <laughs> right, exactly. So okay, so you go to college and you're doing um, engineering, right? Electrical engineering. That was what my you know that's what I signed up for. Okay, so what happened? Um, I didn't last very long. Yeah. And I um I ended up coming back to my hometown. My father got sick, and I ended up staying close to where my dad was and working for another Apple dealer there for a couple years. And then I decided I wanted to move to Florida. And then I was gonna drive down here and it was in the winter. And I had a sister that lived in Lexington, Kentucky and I lived in Ashland, which was on the way. So I stopped in Lexington and then there was a bad storm. And I'm like, I better wait because I don't want to be on the roads and it's, mm -hmm. and it's so dangerous. And I ended up staying in Lexington for a couple of years. <laughs> 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 well, that is often how it happened. Yeah, and I, I was close to my older sister, and mm -hmm. you know, she's a little more alike than my twin sister. And so. you had a job doing computer Yeah, things. I got a job there um, for another Apple dealer. Imagine that. And um, a few weeks after I was so there... So you were like an Apple guru before there were gurus? It's I just what I was familiar with. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just... Um, it's what I just was fortunate enough to be exposed to in, in mm -hmm. an early age. But while I was working at the Apple dealership, um, somebody brought their computer in for service and they were developing software for the kitchen and bath industry. And this was, the Macintosh was out by now. Kitchen and bath industry. Right. Mm -hmm. So it was software where you could go into a kitchen cabinet dealer and say, here's my floor plan. I want to oh, yeah. see in 3D what my kitchen looks like. How much would it cost with like mm -hmm. oak doors versus cherry? So I ended up going to work for that company and became like the director of development and helped um, build like the Windows version for the PC of that software. The Windows version? Right. So this was originally on the Mac and they wanted, because mm. you know, at this time the market was going to the PC, right. they wanted to develop a PC version. So you're sort of a, like a trader. Um, well, <laughs> it was a good opportunity, I guess, yeah, to work with a lot of really bright people and um, the company ended up being acquired by a Fortune 100 company. and I, um, I lasted about six months in the corporate culture and decided that it wasn't for me. <laughs> so you've never gotten a BA or a BS no. or anything? Mm. Nope. Just completely self-taught. Yeah. Hmm. So, okay, so then how do you get to Columbus, Ohio? Um, there was a project that Apple was working on with a grocery store chain called Big Bear. Mm -hmm. There was a company out of Deerfield Beach, Florida called Advanced Promotion Technologies. And they were doing um, marketing based on your shopping history. So you would go through the grocery lane and they would know who you were. What year is this? Um, 90. Really? Huh. Yeah. Yeah, probably 90. Mm -hmm. So this was before um, they were using a stored value card, which is like a little credit card, a loyalty card. Yeah. So you'd be able to um, get coupons based on your shopping history. Right. And they had Macintosh computers. And the company that had been developing it had run into a lot of problems. So they just hired me as a consultant to parachute in and help fix the hmm. software and make it work. One thing that, that, from what you're saying, that's interesting is a lot of these places are using Apple computers or the Macintosh then. Mm -hmm. um, was, did that become normal to, to use the Macintosh for this? Didn't people go over to PCs? Um, I think it depended on the application. 
like mm -hmm. what you were trying to do. I mean, at this time, you know, Apple still had, a, you know, this was before Steve Jobs got fired, you know, by the board. Right. There were still, you know, schools, Apple were the predominant computer. Oh, yeah, um, that's true. And, you know, kiosk projects, like, you know, projects that were more, like, creative were, you know, definitely all on, on the Macintosh mm -hmm. platform. Mm -hmm. The reason I'm asking you all of these questions, like, what happened step by step, is because, um, you know, this whole issue about entrepreneurship, you know, how do you become this, a person like you? And um, it seems to me it's very important to hear how you started. What, what were the things that led you to be who you are, that took a path that wasn't a usual path? And, um, and the story, I mean, one of the things I hear is, one, you're just an unusual guy. You're very smart. Right. And, and you're willing to take risks. And you don't need that security, um, at least when you were younger, that you were willing to go all these places and try all this stuff. Sure. So um, if we, oh, let me change this. OK, so if we look back here, um, these are all companies that you've been part of or started or had a big hand in. Mm -hmm. Or you know, on the left is some of the venture capital funds that have been investors in or that I've worked with. So when I look at this one, for example, Kinetoscope, right. um, when I read your bio, it says from April 1996 to May 1999, staff founded and served as CEO of Kinetoscope. And that worked with General Motors, with US West, with Visa, um, and so on, all these big names. And then it says one of the nation's pioneers in Java-based intelligent agent development. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, um, what is that? So, <laughs> prior to um, working on Kinetoscope, I was out in California in the other Bay Area. I lived near San Francisco, and I mm -hmm. got to um, work on a project for a gentleman named Regis McKenna. Mm -hmm. And while we were working on that software, um, it had to do with competitive positioning. And okay, having what is competitive positioning? Um, it's basically how you market your company and what you want to be when you grow up, and what's your positioning goal, what is it you know, that you aspire to be. Mm -hmm. And Regis had been um, very involved in Silicon Valley. He was involved with the semiconductor industry getting started, um, and he had a PR marketing firm, and actually Apple was one of his first clients, and he was you know, really like a mentor to Steve Jobs. And I knew who he was from, you know, just remember reading you know, the press releases and things when I had the Apple II, it would you know, always say like, you know, for media contact, Regis McKenna. But because we were building this competitive positioning software, part of that would be competitive intelligence. And there was a company. OK, what's competitive intelligence? Um, knowing what your competitors are doing. So if you're a Ford Motor Company, you would be able to get insights by looking at who is General Motors trying to hire for. They're trying to hire mm. some new polymer chemist. So maybe they're getting into you know, composite bodies for cars. Mm -hmm. So you could gain insights by you know, just gleaning information from lots of different sources. Mm -hmm. and while I was out there, there was... Um, now, why doesn't that count as sort of spying? Um, it does. Oh, okay. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it can, but you know, it's, you know, companies have you know, competitive intelligence officers, and they have hmm. people in the organization whose responsibility it is to know what their competitors are up to. Huh. So I got interested in agent technology for the project I was working on for Regis because I saw it as a way to use technology to accelerate learning and get information faster. So Now, how would it accelerate learning? Um, learning of what? Information off of different sources, off of the internet or off of reading. If it's a public company, you might go through their SEC filings and be able to say like, oh, looks like they're maybe going to be getting into this area based on investments or they're having problems over here. So it's just, it takes a lot of, you know, if you don't use a computer to do that, then you have to hire a person. Mm -hmm. And they have to sit down and read all this information and then summarize it. But there's ways that you can use um, this type of technology to learn faster. 
and huh. accelerate the learning curve. So I, I got interested so in... So it makes you more competitive if you have that information. Right. Instead of having to hire six research assistants to go out and read, you know, if huh. you're a Fortune 500 company, you know, huh. depending on your competitors, you may have to spend a lot of time and money and people. And if you can bring information back to the person who's going to take that, you know, look at it, it just makes things go faster. So, it just so have you ever applied it to museums? I don't know. <laughs> but, I mean, the, that was how I got interested in agent technology. And we were working with a company that had um, actually started inside of Apple and spun out called General Magic. And they had a programming language for writing agent applications. And then when we started Kinetoscope, um, one of the um, developers that had worked with me out in California on Crush, um, we talked and you know, kind of talked to each other into starting the company. And he had gone to school in Pittsburgh and then moved to San Francisco. And I said, well, I'm not moving to Pittsburgh. <laughs> like to, he went to Carnegie Mellon. He went to CMU, right. Yeah. And um, I, you know, we just decided that we were going to do it here. So I, I talked to him and his girlfriend into moving down to Florida. And then they had a bunch of smart friends at CMU that were able to hire. And we were you know, really successful in recruiting you know, CMU. So when you develop this, what does it look like? You're sort of in a room with computers and you're all just yeah, I mean, the culture thing? that we had at Kinetoscope, um, you know, I think part of the reason why people wanted to work there was because we didn't have, like, the normal culture of companies in Tampa Bay. It was more, um, you know, just free form. You know, people weren't assigned to cubicles. We had open area. We had, you know, futons in the office. And, you know, people just really loved what they were doing because they were working with a bunch of like-minded people. You know, we provided, you know, all of the Mountain Dew that you wanted to drink. and. You know, just so that's work. the key? That's the drug? Well, you know, it's a, that and just uh -huh. making it fun for people to go to work and not having a dress code and being like you have to wear a tie and shoes and you could come to work in you know, flip-flops and shorts. So who pays for all of this? How do you, um, you know, pay your rent or your mortgage and buy groceries um, at Publix well, if um, you're doing all of this? When we started the company, this was in 96, so there weren't a lot of website development companies and internet mm -hmm. application development companies. And I was in the beginning doing contract programming and development. But then I transitioned to being the business development guy and the CEO of the company. But I still did some contract development just from projects that I had and relationships. And then I became, you know, like the mother bird that would go out and find the worms to bring back to the nest to feed the other programmers. <laughs> Which means you found the money. Yeah, well, it wasn't even that we needed to raise a lot of money because we were going out and getting work because there weren't a lot of people that mm. could do what we were doing. And because we had started... So you were doing other jobs to pay the bills yeah, and we, then you were Yeah, we bootstrapped it. it from just consulting. Mm -hmm. So we would go out and sell you know, a project for $200,000 and be able mm -hmm. to make you know, $120,000 in profit uh -huh. and then be able to fund that development of our own intellectual property uh -huh. and without having to go out to VCs, which you know, venture capitalists. Which you know, I, I think the best way to bootstrap a software company is doing what we did, and that's how Larry Ellison started Oracle. So um, you don't do that anymore. Um, I still do some projects. But you're not CEO for. No, Kinetoscope. What happened was we built up um, our own agent platform, and we started another. Okay, what's an agent platform? Um, so the software that we were writing to build these applications for our customers, we built the tools that we used to write that. Mm -hmm. And this um, agents are really a, a way to um, encapsulate programming functionality into just a little piece of code that's very discreet. Okay. And it was a way for us to take our own tools and go out and get consulting projects, but use our customers' money to fund our own R&D. So we structured our life, the research, research and development. And development. So okay. we were able to you know, bootstrap and self-fund by just going out and you know, being you know, mm -hmm. young and hungry and not knowing any better. And, Getting projects and then reinvesting. And the not knowing any better is a real asset, isn't it? I, absolutely. Yeah. No, it is. I, I agree. No, I mean that's so part of what um, you know happens with companies that get you know mm -hmm. stagnant in their innovation. They have you know, the orthodoxy problem where you can't teach old dogs new tricks. Right. And, and that's you know mm -hmm. part of what I think I've always tried to be aware of and not get caught in mm -hmm. you know, that trap. So did you sell this company? Yeah, what happened was um, I, Damien, who was my partner, wanted to move back to San Francisco. And we had developed the intellectual property for our agent software. And we started a company with our IP, that we, the intellectual property. It was called Power Market. And it was it called what? Power Market. Power Market. And it was based out in Redwood City. 
and then we had uh, near San Francisco. Cal yeah, California. So we had um, like the venture capital firms, Kleiner Perkins and Norwest, invested in the company, and Damien moved back out there and, and with a couple of the other developers. And then I stayed here and started a company with um, Dan Doyle, who's mm -hmm. the founder of Danka, um, Tom Wallace, um, who's the founder of a company um, here in town called Waldeck, and um, it was called Brain Buzz. So we kind of took Kinetoscope and carved oh, it in half. This again. Brain Buzz. <laughs> that one, exactly. So. so is that the plan? Is the plan to develop the company and then sell it? and then develop another company, and then sell it? Um, I mean, that's not the old plan. The old plan is you develop a company and you stay with it, right? And you become the CAO for life. It is, and, yeah, and, but, but I think that um, you know, things change. And I yes, think that um, a lot of times the reason why companies acquire other companies is because they aren't innovating on their own. So they identify a talented team of people who've gone out and taken a risk to solve a problem that might have taken them two or three years to get to on their own. Mm -hmm. So they can accelerate you know, market by going and buying a, a small startup and getting the team, mm -hmm. you know, which is a popular thing right now. Um, but when Kinetoscope was bought out, they didn't get you. No, I stayed. I, I ended up um, basically getting to sell the company twice. So we got oh. equity in Power Market, which was a company that we started in California. And then I had a big equity stake in the brain buzz. I see. So even but though you've sold it, you still have you, Right, you interest. retain ownership, right. Hmm. So how many companies do you uh, maintain ownership in? Um, probably a half a dozen or so now. And are they all profitable? Um, some are, but more are very early stage. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just you know, I'm working on a couple of startups right now that are just you know, brand new baby, so hmm. we haven't got to that point of making money yet. So, would you call yourself an entrepreneur? Um, I think I'm more of a technologist, but I think um, you know, entrepreneurship is sometimes you have to create your own opportunities, and I just don't really want to have a real job. <laughs> <laughs> what What does that mean? What's a real job? Um, I think it means that you have a boss that is like, you know, between Dilbert and office space. And you go into an office and you get like your red stapler and you know, just the culture doesn't fit me. And you know, what happened when you know, I worked for Autograph and we got acquired by Masco Corporation. Autograph, is that up there? Um, I don't know if that one's up there. No, nope. can't but use it was, um, It was just you know, culture shock. I mean, you had guys in suits that came to meetings that wanted to have status meetings about the next status meeting. Uh -huh. And that just, to me, drove me crazy. Yeah. And I was more about, like, wait a second, what's the problem we're trying to solve? What do we need to solve it? And why are we wasting time with all of this? <laughs> so, one of the things you've done, in addition to all these tech things, is you've been involved with this Gazelle Lab. Right. Which is a, let me show the people. Here they are. Um, so this is a is a um, is a project that's focused on entrepreneurship. So you must know something about it. Um, yeah, I mean the whole genesis for Gazelle Lab actually came out of um, just getting tired of seeing my friends leave the area and talent moving to other cities because they didn't see opportunity to stay here and work for a cool startup. And I had been um, when I started Kinetoscope, I was fortunate to get to meet a guy named Brad Feld. Mm -hmm. And Brad is out in Boulder, and Brad's been very much um, now like this celebrity venture capitalist who's really done a great job of educating. Now, how did you meet him? Um, when I worked on the Regis McKenna project, I had a friend in San Francisco that um, knew I was coming back to Florida, and the Kauffman Foundation had an off-site oh. retreat up in North Florida, and the Kauffman Foundation is very... Um, in Kansas City. Right. They, they give they a lot of... They have that entrepreneur. Yeah, they're the largest supporter of entrepreneurship right. in the world. Mm -hmm. and. Um, my friend in San Francisco, Jeff Workman, sent an email to me and Brad and said, hey, Brad, you should meet Marvin. He's down in Florida, and you, know, you guys should just talk, and they were doing some cool stuff. And I got to meet Brad, and we just got to be friends, and I stayed in touch with him since then. But Brad was out in Boulder and had really been probably single-handedly the person responsible for Boulder's entrepreneurial ecosystem mm -hmm. to develop. Mm -hmm. And he's written um, since then a book about building startup communities. And what 
I had been talking to them about, um, I, I went to a conference in Orlando and Brad was there, and there's a program that Brad had invested in in Boulder called TechStars, mm -hmm. and it was an accelerator for startups. And they would basically um, have a betting period and accept companies to come into the program, give them a small amount of capital, pair them up with mentors in the community that could really help them figure out their business model, product development, the things that they needed to launch the business. And I was talking to Brad, I'm like, hey, we, we need to do something like this in Tampa. And I met um, Daniel Scott, who's right here, who had also been talking to, point at him. Yeah, he's, the not, he's the only one with a tie. Um, he doesn't have a tie. No, this guy right here. Oh, him, the tie. Okay. So Is I had he been, here? Yeah, he's actually over here. Oh, yes, right. So I, I had been talking to Brad about Techstars, and then Daniel had also been talking to the Techstars folks through his relationship and his role at USF St. Pete's Entrepreneurship Program. And I was over in Tampa, and he was here, and I remember having, we met at the Museum of Art in Tampa, and I'm like, you know, it doesn't make sense to do this in Tampa and St. Pete. You know, I used the expression, we should put the wood behind one arrow. <laughs> And you should do what? Put the wood behind one arrow. <laughs> so if you think of an archer, <laughs> and just it, we focused on doing it together. Okay. And you know, Daniel had a lot of great experience from being involved with the you know, incubators in town and just mm -hmm. the whole you know, lay of the land as far as economic development offices. And I had a lot of relationships with developers and things. So I ended up getting the initial capital raised for us to do the program last year with Gazelle Lab. And then on um, November 17th, we were actually across the lawn here at the Mahaffey for our investor demo day. And so why is it called Gazelle Lab? Um, there's an expression from the business development office. Um, the, a Gazelle is a company that doubles in size and revenue every year. So they call them Gazelles. <laughs> so that's where the name came from, hmm. from the, the Economic Development and the Small Business Association. Hmm. So who are these other people? Um, this is John Morrow. He's here. Yes, he is. Where, oh, there he is. And then um, this the smiling is John. Guy, yeah, that's John. The smiling guy is Brent Britton. Is he here? I don't think Brent's here. Um, he's okay. a local intellectual property attorney that works a lot with startups. Mm -hmm. And then the gentleman over there is Dr. Bill Jackson, who's over at USF St. Pete Entrepreneurship Program. Mm -hmm. so, and there you are. And that's me. You do not have a tie on. I don't. <laughs> I own ties, but I don't like to wear them unless it's like a funeral or a wedding. So. <laughs> So um, what is an entrepreneur and why is that so important? Um, well, I think entrepreneurs are who create opportunity for the rest of society. And I think that somebody that's willing to um, take a risk and they're compelled to solve a problem. And I remember you know, one of the things I learned from Regis McKenna was you know, it's really simple, just find a need and fill it. <laughs> But then isn't everybody who starts a business an entrepreneur? Sure. Oh. Then the reason I'm asking is when you listen to the discussion that's going on, especially during you know the presidential election, all this stuff, we're hearing all of this discussion about the importance of entrepreneurs and, and um, supporting them. And it makes it sound like an entrepreneur is a special class of citizen that has just all of a sudden, you know, emerged. Um, and they've been around a long time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that, um, you know, in the last couple of years, there's been a, um, more of a fascination about entrepreneurship and about startups in general. And why is that? Um, I mean, I think a lot of it is uh, what's happened with the economy. People can't find work, so they go out and, like, you know, I'll just work for myself and go out. You know, if you're technical right now, you can find work pretty easily. But mm -hmm. um, I think also, two things like the movie The Social Network that kind of personified, mm -hmm. you know, the wealth creation for you know, people like Mark Zuckerberg. Right. And, you know, that's probably a big driver of it. So everyone wants to be like. I, I think, Mark I mean, Zuckerberg. the next, you know, the, the young up and coming, you know, entrepreneurs have ambition or aspiration to be the next Steve Jobs or the next Mark Zuckerberg. Or, mm -hmm. I think it's, that's a big driver. So um, how does it work with Gazelle Lab or with what you do? You've sort of explained it, but when you're mentoring somebody, um, what are just simply, what are the steps you go through? What do you, what's the main thing you tell somebody? Um, 
you're trying to help them figure out how to de-risk their business. Okay, what does that mean? Um, take away the things that are impediments to their success. Can you give an example? So there's different areas of building the business. So there might be um, the financial modeling. So if you're a programmer, you might not have any idea how to read a P&L statement or how to do a balance sheet or an income statement or have take, you know, or paid mm -hmm. attention in accounting classes. Right. So you know, depending on the need of the team of the entrepreneurs, we would try to pair them up with mentors. If it's, you know, we need help with our financial model and our projections, and we, would, you know, we had former CFOs of companies here in town that were willing to donate their time to spend with the startup teams and say, I got this, I'll help you do the right Excel model so you, when you show investors, you're not embarrassed, that you have mm -hmm. a, a really professionally prepared financial model. Mm -hmm. If it's product development um, and you need help building a prototype or finding a graphic designer to come up with a logo or a programmer to write you know, your first version of your, your website or your iPhone app, mm -hmm. that's, that's part of you know, just helping to find the team. Yeah. I mean, and that was, you know, for me, one of the roles that I played with Gazelle. Some of the companies needed to have like a technical co-founder. And I've always you know, stayed in touch with the best programmers I've ever worked with all over. And you know, one of our companies that's you know, probably the most successful one so far needed a technical co-founder. And you know, I talked to my friend Matt out of quitting his day job and becoming their CTO. Mm -hmm. So there's this sexiness about being an entrepreneur. But not everyone can be an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. right? And use the word team. I mean, right. an entrepreneur needs a team. Right. So why would someone want to be an a team person and not be the entrepreneur? Um, well, you can't do it all by yourself. And you have to be able to have other people that are helping you accomplish your goals. And you can, for, you know, I'm interested in technology entrepreneurship because that's what I know. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's different aspects of it. You need to have, um, you know, somebody who's good and an extrovert that can go out and do business development and sell. And most technical people aren't good at that. I mean, they, Hurt. And Steve Jobs was really good at that. Yeah, he was a perfect example of someone who was really good at it. But mm -hmm. you know, he wasn't that technical. So right. without was Steve friend. Wozniak, right. he wouldn't have been able to you know build the first Apple computer. Right. Exactly. Um, you know, Mark Zuckerberg gets all the credit, but there's another half dozen guys that helped mm -hmm. him build Facebook. Mm -hmm. You know, the same with Google. There's you know the two founders, and they complemented each other. Mm -hmm. So it's you know, part of that is building a team. So there's a difference and. In, in talking to you and then researching about this thing, one of the things that I found very interesting is there's this whole rhetoric in this country about you know the individual who does everything. But when you talk about the stuff you work on and this, um, these entrepreneurial um, startups, they're all teams. Right. They're all groups of people who work together and without them, it would never work. Right. So it really, you know, it's a very different model and a very different metaphor um, than the, you know, lone individual. I mean, the best analogy is probably a rock band. Yeah, I mean, rock you, band. You need a singer, you need a drummer, you need a guitarist, you need a keyboard mm -hmm. player. You know, if you look at like, you our backgrounds here to start Gazelle Lab, I mean, mm -hmm. Brent was legal, John was a very successful mm -hmm. entrepreneur. You know, Bill is coming at it from the academic perspective. Daniel had mm -hmm. been an entrepreneur and yeah. you know, had the education, you know, academic perspective. So mm -hmm. the five of us, our backgrounds complemented right. each other. Right. It's this all weaving together um, a talent to make one very powerful thing. Right. That to me is very interesting. And I think that that's a model for the 21st century. I think it's happened all the time, but I think it's a very different way of looking at things. And um, these tech startups really work that way. And, you know, I, ha I have to say that one of the reasons is, is that, you know, when you look at, I mean, I used to do computer programming and hang out with mathematicians, and, you know, they aren't really out there. You know, they, they're in their thing, they're eating at their, you know, and they don't like talking to you. And so it is a, 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 a loner, but a group of people who have that. Right. And it does really matter that you're connected in very important ways. Yeah, I mean, ways. I think that what you're describing, what is really important is the culture that the you culture. create. And 
the team cohesion. And that's a technical term, the culture. Um, well, that's come up with this tech stuff. I, but I think it has to do with how people on the team have mutual respect, how they, excuse me, how they interact. Um, I always think about, you know, if you're trying to build a team for a startup, if you were young enough to get drafted for Vietnam, you want to have people on your team that you would mm. feel comfortable having in your foxhole. Mm -hmm. And that closeness and that bond, and you know, you're <laughs> spending more time with your co-founders than you are with your family. Mm -hmm. So you have to get along and work out your right. conflict resolution skills and things. But I mean, that's the single most important aspect of you know, successful companies is that, that cohesion of the team. So um, one thing about um, these technical startups, and this is an example, and you know, I've been around some of them, is that they tend to be white and they tend to be guys. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what's that about? Um, I think that's changing. I mean, I think that just you know, historically, there hasn't been a lot of females going into math and science and mm -hmm. learning programming. And you know, there's a lot of people trying to change that. Yes. And there's been a lot of studies about successful companies that had female CEOs or female directors and that how you can mm -hmm. quantify how that perspective makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as um, the ethnicity element, there was a talk at TED Tampa this year and there's a founder of a startup who's African American who put a slide up that had all of the like NBA players on the right, you know, the famous NBA players, mm -hmm. Michael Jordan and what their net worth was. And then on the left, he put up the white guys and had Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg. And, you know, there's extra commas in their oh, net yeah. worth on the left where, you know, the Shaquille O'Neal might be worth $100 million, but you have some founder of a technology company who happens to be Caucasian yeah. that's worth, you know, $3 billion. Yeah, and, not more. And I think people are, you know, mm -hmm. cognizant of that and aware mm -hmm. of it. And, you know, we're trying to do what we can to nurture entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. There's a program in town that was started by a gentleman named Kurt Long that um, Daniel and I actually just met with him yesterday. And it's the Future Entrepreneurs Network. And he has a company that he's quietly built up about 60 employees here in Carillon in mm -hmm. St. Pete. And he's going out to the Pinellas Education Foundation, reaching out to 11th and 12th graders and trying to encourage mm. you know, diversity and entrepreneurship, but to plant those seeds in high school. Yes. And they had 88 students get accepted into this program and they're having you know, sort mm -hmm. of a mini gazelle lab with, with mm -hmm. these you know, high school kids that want to be right. entrepreneurs. And that's so important. I mean, I, when we spoke, I mean, I related to experience I had in high school where I excelled in math and science and I was the lone female with all the guys and I was clearly pushed out. I mean, they didn't like if I did better than them, and it was, you know, very ostracized. Mm -hmm. I mean, that I'm hoping that, you know, that's much different now. But the key is to get it in high school or even earlier. Earlier, I develop think. Develop that. I, you can do that, and you're welcome. Absolutely. And I, I mean, I think that, you know, some of the most talented like, developers I've worked with, you know, in the past have been female. Mm -hmm. And I've worked with really bright African-American programmers, mm -hmm. but, you know, they're one of 100. Right. And the, and the goal is to make it normal. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if there was somebody, let's say in this room, who was interested in doing one of these startups, or, and it doesn't have to be technical, it can be anything, um, what would you suggest that they do? Um, there's a lot of information available on the internet now, on the web. I so think where would you go? Um, and I, I think it depends what type of business you're thinking about starting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if it's something related to technology, there's a lot of resources and a lot of great books out now that you can go find. And there's tons of you know, slide share presentations and YouTube videos. And you know, Brad Feld has been you know, very, mm -hmm. you know, very passionate about just sharing his life his experiences. His website's really good. Yeah, his website um, you know, with the Techstars model. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I think the most important thing to help someone is to find a mentor. And you know, for me, growing up in a little town in Kentucky, there wasn't a lot of like tech entrepreneur executives that I could go reach out to. You know, I remember the stories about Steve Jobs just picking up the phone, and you know, he right. was a little kid and called, you know, called up, you know, Bill Hewlett at Hewlett Packard yeah. and said, "I'm, you know, can you give me some parts?" And, right. And there, you don't have that. And mm -hmm. I think here, you know, we've been very open about just trying to give back to the community, and 
you know, share our experiences and our knowledge and you know, all of us are very accessible that we're part of Gazelle and you know, mm -hmm. part of, we feel like our responsibility is to help young entrepreneurs and give back and share life lessons and you know, mistakes that we've made and try to help companies you know, just nurture them along a little bit. But I mean, that was the, the thing I would encourage is just you know, find a mentor. So do you think that there's something special about this Bay Area? I do. And what do you think that is? Um, I think the, um, the talent here is as good as it is in Palo Alto. Hmm. I mean, there's programmers and developers here that I know that you know, could be working at Google. And Apple and other companies, and a lot of the people that had worked for me before at Kinetoscope you know, went up to the Bay Area and got jobs at startups that got bought by Google and Apple and Facebook later. So I, I don't think there's any issues with the quality of the talent. I mean, the issue here really it has to do with just the life cycle that we're at. I think the... What does that mean? Um, it's kind of like, um, you know, the chromosomes are just coming together. You know, we haven't really had the history here. Uh -huh. And there haven't been a lot of successful entrepreneurs here that have stayed in the area and are willing to take some of you know, the money that they've made from exiting their mm -hmm. company and reinvest it back into startups. You know, one of the negatives I think about the community here is there is a lot of wealth, but it's very cliquish, and it's hard for young entrepreneurs to get access to capital. Mm -hmm. And the reason why people graduate from USF St. Pete with an entrepreneurship degree and move up to New York is because they get frustrated with trying to find a startup here that's funded that can help them pay for the ramen noodles. Mm -hmm. You just don't have that here, and that, that's really mm -hmm. the big constraint is just an people willing to take some of their assets and allocate you know, a small percentage to just you know, betting on a founder of a company. And here, kid, there's 50 grand. I hope you make it. And how can I help you? I'll open my Rolodex and introduce you to people. So there's not enough people willing to do that. If that were to happen, what would this area look like? I mean, how would it alter this or enrich this? I mean, I think it's about keeping people here and keeping the talent from leaving. And you know, there's an a, a iPhone developer that's a friend of mine that had a job in San Francisco, and I talked him out of it. I'm like, you know, you can go out there or you can stay here. And, you know, you can build a startup and it can be a life-changing event. If it's successful, mm -hmm. then you don't ha you can go to San Francisco for vacation. You, know, <laughs> you, you don't have to like move away from here. And you just have to create the opportunities. So it's in your interest and my interest and everyone else's interest to have these talented people here. I mean, this room is filled with talented people, and uh, the whole thing is we all like to be around people who are smart and creative and interesting and are doing um, innovative things. So the more we can have more of those people, I mean, and it's a selfish thing, but It's a rising thing, tide. The all boats yeah. rise, right? Yeah. Better for the community. We get a bigger tax base. We get just more um, creative things happening in our lives and quality and goes up. Being able to support the arts and mm -hmm. education and you know, giving back to the community. Contribute to the Dali. What a great idea. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's, what's, that what, that's what matters. Mm -hmm. I mean. So the other thing is, is that um, you don't spend all your time um, with a computer and doing this. You have a family. I do. Yeah. <laughs> And so how does that um, work into your life? Um, it's hard I mean, because I have an offshore development team that I work with. And there's an offshore development team? Right. And you mean in like in the Cayman Islands? Or uh, no, they're, they're actually in Pakistan. But it's not so much, it's more about being able to leverage them in a 24-hour day. Mm -hmm. So there's nine hours time and difference. Mm. But and you, just, you have to try to make a balance and try to spend time with your family, but also be able to stay in touch with you know, your responsibilities that help support your family. Mm -hmm. That's a big issue. It is. I mean, it's an issue everybody. everybody. deals with it, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some people more successfully than others. Yeah. Hmm. So, um, would anybody like to ask Marvin a question? Yes, could you stand up and say your name? Uh, my name is Jack McCullough. And I was wondering, Martin, with all these companies you've been working on, it's mostly software related, correct? Right. How yeah. much of an issue or a barrier are the current intellectual property laws? And, and what point do you start worrying? Has somebody already patented something, or am I going to end up getting this, this, this dreaded letter from some Fortune 50 company saying, I, go away? I 
honestly, I think that's one of the big problems now. Um, Mark Cuban, who has been, you know, he bought the Dallas Mavericks. He started a company and sold it um, to Yahoo called Broadcast.com. And he's written a lot and been very loud about this, where if you're a startup and you're able to raise money, the last thing you want to do as an investor is have to take some of that money and go defend yourself in a frivolous patent mm -hmm. lawsuit and get involved in litigation. And for me personally, I think the patent system has to be reformed for software because it's too difficult to tell what is prior art and to know what you're being in, like, possibly infringing on. And I think that you should be judged based on your ability to go out and get and keep customers and execute on your business plan, not by being first to go and you know, get a patent at the patent office because they're overwhelmed and they don't have enough technical people to review the patent applications and say, oh, this is just like these other 30 patents over here, they shouldn't get it. You know, it's just like the dude sitting there at the rubber stamp and the patents fly through. And, I mean, for me, intellectual property and software, I think, is broken. And it, it, there's a lot of activity in Congress and things to try to make it you know, better. And the vulnerability comes only when you start making money from it, and then you get noticed, and then something right. goes after. And it's expensive. I mean, I, I've been involved in patents and getting patents and also being involved in patent litigation. And you have to write a couple million dollar check to do patent litigation these days for software. So I, I think it's very negative and like a caustic, bad environment for intellectual property, for patents and so software. So what would it startups. take to change that? Um, there's some activity now to try to use technology to make it easier to get an assessment of prior art. There's a project called Peer Patent Online. Um, was that a startup? Um, it was actually facilitated by the government and by mm -hmm. some large institutions that you know were also frustrated and you know tired mm -hmm. of wasting money on you know frivolous lawsuits for patent litigation that you shouldn't be able to get patents and basic things in software that you know somebody else thought of it already 15 years ago. Hmm. Thank you. Who else has a question? Yes, could you stand up and say your name, please? Uh, Mark, I just want to know what industry do you see in the computer industry for the company For here? Yeah. Uh, as far as industries and technology? Or yeah, just in general, what um, you up and coming like business areas, or um, yeah, I mean, there's a whole meme now around like the quantified self. So I don't know if you've seen a company called Fitbit. That, What's a quantified self? Um, so your car has a dashboard. So you have, you know, you know where your oil pressure is. You know, like what your water temperature is. So you should be able to have that information about your body. I know like, you know, today I walked 3,000 steps and burned, you know, 400 calories. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the whole, um, like, health and wellness and being able to have, you know, take technology and use it to just have a better quality of life. And I think there's a lot of opportunities. Um, and have that without having to go to a doctor. Yeah, I mean, there's, um, mm -hmm. like, the whole health 2.0 thing that's going on, um, being able to, um, you know, instead of, um, think about, like, on the iPhone with, the way Siri works today. Mm -hmm. So if you could fast forward that a couple of years and on the other side of the, who you were talking to on the phone was the best physician that you could ever go to, but their knowledge had been encapsulated in software and you could say, you know, I've been running a fever and I have a sore throat, mm -hmm. you know, what's going on? Should I go to the doctor? And having like this conversational interface with the computer to help you feel mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think there's areas of technology that are gonna make, you know, life sciences and things just better. Yes, could you stand up and say your name? Yeah, there was, um, I went out to Minnesota a couple months ago. There was um, a conference, it was called Data Venue, and it was about the whole personal data ecosystem. And there was um, 
one of the speakers is a guy named Doc Searles, and he wrote a book called The Intention Economy. And just, um, there's a lot of groups, and actually the US is probably behind like the European Union and making it um, more of a legal issue for having databases about your, you know, where you, what you bought at Publix, mm -hmm. and for marketers to be able to get access to that. And I think there's... Um, Didn't you write a software um, for grocery companies so that they could find out what you did? <laughs> yeah, the, that was one of the, the projects I did work on. Yes. But I mean, I, I think that um, there's a consumer revolt around mm -hmm. marketers taking your information. And there's um, an area now in like enterprise software for marketing called sentiment analysis, where you can look at called what? sentiment, it's like sentiment. how you feel about things. So the sentiment. Right, okay. so like the consumer packaged goods companies are able to learn about you based on your Facebook posts or your mm -hmm. Foursquare check-ins or your Twitter stream. Mm -hmm. And using that information to target advertising to you that, oh, I see you go check in a lot at Subway, Don, I'm gonna give you a yeah. coupon for, <laughs> you know, and, and I think you know, consumers um, are sick of it and fed up with it. But that should be your decision. Right. And I think if you look at what Microsoft's doing now with um, like, the next version of Internet Explorer, it has a feature called Do Not Track, and it's turned on by default. So if you want somebody on the internet that you go to their website with that browser, you're going to explicitly have to let them know what information you feel comfortable with sharing. So I mean, I think there's already steps being taken by companies to try to make you know, consumers feel more comfortable that you know, there isn't this Orwellian big brother kind of thing going on with your personal data. Who else has a question? Yes, could you stand up and say your name, please? I have a question. Uh, you talked about the applications that you have, the, the cyber systems you're doing, and all the marketing you can do with that, and things like that. And over the last hundred years, as we get new technology, it changed the way people work. They, they made you wear products, and now they work in a factory. And continue. Are we getting to a point where people aren't going to be able to move up to the next technology? Um, I, I think there's um, there's a guy named Ray Kurzweil who's an inventor, and he has this um, theory about the law of accelerating returns. And from my own experience, if I think about, I was interested in programming, but I had to wait every month for the magazine to come to learn. But today, you can go online and you can learn in four minutes what have taken me four weeks to wait for. And I think that um, people are just going to get shifted around. Like technology is going to make our lives easier. You know, think about like um, you know, DARPA funded a project for autonomous vehicles, so that you could basically have a computer smart enough to be able to drive the car for you. Mm -hmm. So think about you know Google latched onto the team that did that, and they have the Google self-driving car. So think about you know the no DUIs, <laughs> like your computer isn't you know out drinking too many beers. You know, there's advantages to that. Mm -hmm. And what's happening you know with the application of technology, it's just accelerating. But you know, I think there are going to be industries and people that don't necessarily keep up with the impact that it has on just humanity, that they will be negatively impacted by that. So, do you see any, um, this is to follow up here, do you see any negative things about this development of technology um, to the way human beings live? I mean, I think that, um, you don't have these types of conversations. And I think that a lot Who of doesn't have these people, human beings don't, because you're sitting behind your laptop and you're oh. talking to somebody on instant messenger, or emailing or texting back and forth. It, you get like dumbed down from that. And mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot to be said for like the tacit knowledge exchange that humans have by just me being able to sit here and see you nodding and hearing mm -hmm. the inflection in your voice. Technology takes a lot of that away. Yeah. So you don't get that, and I, I think there's... Or people send those little picture, like the little icons. Emoticons. That drives me crazy. Yeah, like so... Like, what does that mean, <laughs> you know? It means I'm rolling on the floor laughing, or right, it means or, I'm happy, or yeah, I'm right. sad. It means I can't say anything. But, you know, I, I think <laughs> that you have to... There's a role and a place for technology, and I see it, you know, trying to make people's lives better. You know, like the wellness thing, you, you can do a lot mm -hmm. for, you know, the obesity epidemic by helping people monitor their caloric intake and take better care of mm -hmm. themselves and applications like that that have positive. But, I mean, there's also negative things about it, too. That, you know. So in your family, I mean, 
do you talk to your wife and your children, or do you text them, or what do you do? It depends. I mean, I mean, if you're at home at the dinner table, do you text each no, other? No, I've gotten texts when I'm downstairs in the kitchen to bring coffee oh, yeah. upstairs well, for my wife. That. But, yeah, sure. <laughs> but no, I think you, you know, I, I'm kind of burned out on email and things. Like, I try to have face-to-face -face meetings with people and conversations, mm -hmm. or talk at least talk to them on the phone, mm -hmm. just because you get kind of desensitized to that. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I think that's kind of sad. Mm -hmm. you know, there was a lot to be said before technology and the internet where families would huddle around you know, and like have dinner together. Yeah. And how was your day? And you, know, well, you, you just you lose a lot of, of that. Well, you become sort of this disembodied entity. Right. That, you know, the physical entity is pretty important. There's a communication. And no, it's, you mean, I, I mentioned Ray Kurzweil earlier. When I was working with the Venture Capital Fund, I was interested in nanotechnology. Mm -hmm. And I used to go to a lot of the nanotechnology mm -hmm. conferences. And a lot of the like, whack jobs in the nanotech community have gone out and like, had their brains frozen. Yeah. And they believe that eventually mm -hmm. the nanotechnology and the technologies will catch up so they can be thawed out and do the Jurassic Park thing and like, bring them yeah. back to life. And so where do you <laughs> I, get your brain frozen? Um, Alcor is one of the companies. And what is that in California? It's in Arizona. Arizona. That one is. But like Walt Disney had that done. Oh yes, I know. Like there was so a big dispute. So how much does it cost to get your brain frozen? It's expensive. Oh, it must be. And like you have to pay for it every year. Or they unplug the freezer and then. <laughs> so how does Walt Disney pay to continue to? I'm sure the estate there is, does, yeah, as yeah, a right. state takes uh, care of that. Okay. He but. comes back. He they thaw him out to, so he can charge his credit. Card. Right. Uh, um, yes, could you stand up and say your name, please? Hi, uh, Dave Oda. I have a question about venture capital. You mentioned earlier um, raising money, but if you get to Kickstarter and websites mm -hmm. like that, um, it seems like more and more I'm seeing these requests through my Facebook community or email mm -hmm. from friends or friends of friends to kick in money for specifically a movie or an album or part of yeah. the company. I, I think that's awesome. I mean, I think that um, you know, there's been um, activity with the recent legislation around the Jobs Act to make it easier for entrepreneurs to raise money and solicit investors and to use what's called crowdfunding to do that. And I think that that's great. I mean, I think there's a lot of companies that don't need that much money. And I have friends that are indie game developers and they want to be game developers and they need somebody to help you know, pay their bills for a few months and they can go build a Kickstarter page and then people like the concept that they have and they'll give them 20 bucks or 25 bucks and then they can get their project funded. But I think it levels the playing field though, it yeah. makes it easier. Well, I understand that part, but the, um, I ask because I only have like 15 uh, mm. Kickstarter computers because I have to send uh, the money to some place that just happens to go away overnight. That, that, that happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Yeah, and I think back to what we were talking about earlier with like the consumer sentiment. I think there is a lot of that um, like negative sentiment and fatigue about you know getting done for you know on Facebook. Go support my Kickstarter project and give me fifty bucks. And so you know, people are worn out by a lot of that. What's the tax code about that? Suppose that you contribute fifty dollars. Is that tax deductible? Is um, it a gift? No, or? it's more just the way the Securities and Exchange Commission has always looked at. Um, entrepreneurs to be able to go out and solicit investors. Mm -hmm. It had to only be with accredited investors, and which means that you have um, like a, a certain level of net worth or a certain level of income. Mm -hmm. It's basically pushing it down so that you can go out and just you know ask somebody to give you money that doesn't right. have to be an accredited but investor. But I mean, up if you give fifty dollars, can you deduct that on your taxes as a gift? N not or? for like a Kickstarter project. No. Because no. mm -hmm. I usually bet people you get would like ask the, that. Yeah, you know, I'm willing to do that if I could deduct it on my taxes as a gift or a yeah, for there, charitable it's more, donation. There's like different levels. So like if mm -hmm. it's a project that, you know, a Kickstarter, you know, if you're trying to raise $3,000, if you give $25, you get early access to whatever oh. it is. Mm -hmm. If you give $75, you get early access to it and a t-shirt. <laughs> if you give $100, you get the t-shirt signed by the team or something. So, you know, people try to incent behavior through different tiers and the amount that you Also, maybe the raise should do that. Right, the stadium Kickstarter project. Right. Okay, um, I think 
we need to go because the museum actually closes. Um, so thank you so much um, for coming. Um, next month, at the end of the month, the 29th of November, my guest is going to be Peter Besser, who's the head of Downtown Partnership for St. Petersburg. He used to be the dean of the Marine Science um, at, right here at USF. He's a fascinating man. He's done so much to develop downtown and, and the bigger picture of St. Pete in the Tampa Bay area. Um, and um, you all have an assignment to um, go out and uh, form a startup and then um, come back and contribute to the Dali Museum. So awesome. thank you for coming and let's thank Marvin. Thank you.